Week one of OTAs is in the books, and the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette was right on hand for all of it. We talked to a lot of the veterans, new and old, and we're going to get to some of their quotes on the show when we were in the lock, the Steelers locker room over the past week. We'll talk about them, about how they're all fitting in together, as well as the new veteran that's going to be added to the room, Marcus Golden. All that and more here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Also, some Buckos talk at the end of the show, getting ready for the weekend series against the Seattle Mariners, whether or not they can turn it around. We got a full pack show for you here heading into the weekend. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. And as always, we bring this show to you Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays right here for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Whether you're listening to us on your favorite podcasting app or watching us on YouTube, you can get all our Post-Gazette content at post-gazette.com on our YouTube page. Check us out for for all of our great content. Remember, this show is Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We have daily content that comes out all the time from people like Brian Batko, who does a lot of great writing on the Pittsburgh Steelers. We have Brian with us here today, and uh, Brian, you and I were at the Steelers facility all week long, three days of OTAs practice, and we got to see a few things here, and it was interesting to talk to the veterans. We, you know, we did rookie camp, we got to talk to the rookies, and we've kind of known that, but one thing was going to be interesting to see was how the new veterans that they did, and they have a lot of them, you know, they, they're bringing in guys like Keanu Neal, Patrick Peterson, Isaac Siomalo, uh, guys that are going to be fitting around in several different parts of this Steelers roster, but it seemed like everyone kind of understood how they fit in. There was no, they, you know, all the new guys were saying like, hey, we're not trying to overstep. We know that there's leadership here already with the with TJ Watts and Cam Haywards and Minka Fitzpatrick's and guys like that, but they also know that they got to contribute something and kind of bring something to the table here. Yeah, I think that's a great point by you, Chris. I mean, it just seems like, you know, from talking to Patrick Peterson this week or whether it was Allen Robinson or I wasn't in, but I know uh, Ray Fittipaldo was mm-hmm. in with Isaac Sayamalu, so I heard some of that. Uh, it's just the Steelers brought a lot of a lot of grown ups into the room, uh, for lack of a better term, this off season. You know, they got a lot of. Uh, I think you're going to hear the words low maintenance a lot from Mike Tomlin <laughs> this season when he's and and off season when he's talking about some of these veteran acquisitions and, and it's guys bringing up kind of unprompted. You know, for instance, Allen Robinson taking George Pickens under his wing, or Patrick Peterson taking Joey Porter Jr. under his wing, and like even. Mm-hmm. You know, we've talked on the show before about how deep this roster is right now and how that ultimately is inevitably going to lead to some guys out of a job because of just uh, how competitive Omar Khan and Andy Weidel have made the roster this offseason. But, I mean, I even noticed talking to guys, uh, you know, a little bit more on the fringe like Montrevious Adams or Braden Fajoko in the defensive line room you know, they don't really feel like they're in a competition, at least not yet. Uh, It feels like it's just, you know, 80 some guys, a lot of whom have been there, done that with NFL experience and are trying to get each other better. So I guess that's always kind of, you know, what you expect or what you would hope players will say in in May. But uh, I do really do get that sense and and get that vibe uh, that the, the culture is pretty good right now in this locker room. And uh, they've they've grown up, uh, I guess, in this transition transitional period in the post Ben Roethlisberger era. I, I think that that's something certainly that's going on there. Uh, to give an example of one of the veterans, let's just listen to what Patrick Peterson had to say about him fitting in on this team and roles as far as this is a guy who might be headed to the Hall of Fame someday for all the Pro Bowls that he's made and all the many years that he's had. This was him in the Steelers locker room talking to us uh, just about his role in fitting in on the team. Here's Patrick Peterson. I'm just coming to help as best as I can. This is This is Cam. Mika, uh, TJ's team, you know, I'm just coming to, to do my part. And that's to, you know, if that's to take, you know, a little weight off their shoulders, off leadership, so be it. If it's, you know, to, 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 to gather the guys around more, 
so be it. You know, so I'm just here to give a helping hand. I'm not coming here to look to take over the locker room or re, re redefine my position on this football team. I just want to come here and help this team be as good as we can be. Patrick, now that you've been you've been through a little bit of with these guys, how much versatility is in that secondary? I mean. Every guy in the room can play a different position, and that's I believe that's what can make us that much dangerous because when quarterback line up, they see guys in different positions, they kind of get like a like a almost uh, almost said a bad word, but <laughs> they kind of get like a, a brain fart into like what that guy's doing. He don't he don't he don't belong there. I didn't see him there on tape, and that kind of give us a dis uh, an advantage of them not knowing what we're playing because we put so many guys in different positions. So, Brian, a lot of things that to take in there about what, what word I, was he going to say? Uh, well, he said brain fart eventually, right? So he probably said like mind, you know, mind, you know yeah. maybe maybe mind f, maybe in a, a, a dump or another word for a dump. Uh, but uh, but maybe. but either way, I, I think okay. that what was what's interesting here is that when you're listening to Patrick Peterson, like he understands the temperament and the deference that's been established already, and he's here to contribute to it, not as much take it over and also understands that like there's going to be benefits to having guys understanding across the board what their responsibilities are communication and how that might give the Steelers advantages on the field and he's a dad so he's going out of his way not to swear uh that's always good <laughs> too but no we I appreciate mean, yeah. that for the podcast <laughs> right yes for sure um yeah I mean he's got a presence about him just even in the locker room and seeing him out there on the practice field and, and I think we know at this point in his 30s he's He's going to get some rest days. He's going to get some vet days that allow Joey Porter Jr. or Corey Trice to get a longer look, uh, you know, say when the ones face off against the ones in practice and in and in camp. So um, as long as he's – yeah, I mean, I, I think it's – I guess off the field-wise, that's good for the vibes of the team. And on the field, though, it's also good just from an X's and O's standpoint that he is willing to – uh, you know, be used in a different spot if if that's kind of where they want to tweak his role at times. And to me, you know, it's it's also kind of similar to like an Allen Robinson in the receiving core. I, I think on one hand, yes, it's good to have his eyes and his experience working with your top players. At the same time, if physically he's not where he used to be, uh, you know, maybe he will take a backseat at times to a Calvin Austin or somebody who's you know not quite on our radar yet, uh, whether that's an Anthony Miller or somebody like that who's going to try to work their way up the ranks. And in the cornerback room, for instance, if Patrick Peterson you know doesn't quite have it the way he used to in Arizona, uh, maybe he does get you know eclipsed at some point by Joey Porter Jr. But if that is, is to happen in, to any extent, it doesn't seem like there are going to be any hard feelings there. I know that's easy to say in May. Um, but all these guys are, are kind of, it seems like they're understanding what they're getting into. And we know that hasn't necessarily always been the case with the Steelers and veterans with Mike Tomlin and veterans, yeah. both on the inside and coming from the outside. Um, so it, at least there are some positive signs there so far. I, I agree. It seems like these are more positive signs. We'll talk about some of those signs and also how more of these guys are going to mesh because, you know, again, we're talking about some of the new faces here and how there's so many of them. There is the question, can the Steelers on either side of the ball maintain their continuity, especially on defense? Because that's where there's another new face coming in that we should talk about. We will talk about that with Marcus Golden as well. And the guy who'll be backing up, TJ Watt. We have him that'll be on the podcast with some of the things he said in the locker room. All that and more here on the North Shore Drive podcast. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast, Chris Carr with Brian Batko breaking things down for you. And Brian, you alluded to this. The Steelers did end up signing Marcus Golden. Ray Fitzwald and I talked about the possibility of that with his visit that was coming in this past week. And it did happen. He's with the Pittsburgh Steelers, one-year deal. And he brings your experienced edge depth there. Brian, what do you think that Brian that, 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 that Marcus Golden brings to the table? Is he a legit you know, a ed, ed, third edge rusher op- option that's going to be a different, bring something different than what Malik Reed brought uh, when he was coming off the bench last year. He better, he better bring something different than Malik Reed because, uh, you know, Malik Reed was a nice guy, but he just didn't provide much, whether that was a, you know, miss 
evaluation by the Steelers and how he was going to fit or whether he's just on the downside, downslope of his career or was just asked to simply do too much at times when T.J. Watt went down. But even when Watt was back, you know, Reed, I don't think he really was able to ever find his groove in, in that role. And it's it's tricky. I mean, we know a, a few years ago when Melvin Ingram did look pretty good in that role, it, it turned into a situation where he wanted more than the Steelers were willing to give him in terms of the playing time and all that. I, I just would hope that the Steelers learned their lesson from that, um, you know, that scenario there. And that when Golden was here on his visit Wednesday, which, I mean, seeing him down there at the facility, he seemed very fired up and vice versa. But um, hopefully that they liked what they heard from him in terms of his expectations. And you've got to hope for the Steelers' sake that he also liked what he heard from them in terms of whether that's, hey, TJ and Alex aren't going anywhere. We want them out there 80% of the time or so. But, you know, those other 20, 15 snaps, uh, we need you to go in there and make a difference for us and uh, give us the best that you've got in your age 32 season. And that's why I think this marriage can work because if Golden is somebody who's realistic enough to know at this point in his career, like I'm, I might not be 11 and a half sack Marcus Golden anymore, but I can still get, I can still get to the QB when I get my chances and that's good for me. And I want to be a part of something great. Uh, then I think that can be exactly the type of guy that they need, especially if a rookie such as Nick Herbig is not quite ready yet for that amount of uh, that amount of production. I agree with it. You see there. I also think it, it's a legitimate question, a legitimate, you know, if, if people are asking, well, wait a second, I understand that there's a lot of excitement with Patrick Peterson, now Marcus Golden and, you know, Landon Roberts Cole, all these new faces. It sounds cool to have them just on the team, but do they fit? And that's a good question. And TJ Watt was asked that question about that in the locker room. Here was TJ Watt on Thursday after OTAs talking about how those new additions might fit in with the Steelers. Uh, so every year we're adding people, so I don't I don't know if it's any truly any different. This time of year is always super important. I mean, that's why we're all here. And, uh, we're just trying to get better each and every day, trying to grow, trying to learn from each other, you know, trying to learn how we practice, how we do things here in Pittsburgh, and also being open-minded to the guys that are veterans that have done things uh, successful in other places. Last. So a thing there to note, and a, a point that he brings up last year, they had new guys like Larry Okunjobi, like Miles Jack, like Levi Wallace, and Demonte KZ, who all fit in pretty well. But that does that's not guaranteed to happen every year. But it, it does seem that something that this core that's mainly, you know, T.J. Watt, uh, Alex Highsmith, uh, uh, Cam Hayward, and Micah Fitzpatrick, and that crew that they've kind of been there to see over the past few years, is that is that something you see that's going to be easy enough to carry over with this crew? Or is that going to be a sticking point that you see coming with them in the upcoming season, Brian? No, I mean, I think the fit the fits will be fine. I think the bigger question is, are guys like Patrick Peterson and Marcus Golden and you know, are they washed? You know, is Cole Holcomb good enough? Is a Landon Roberts good enough? Like just to be quite blunt with you. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're golden and you're available into late May, um, you know, maybe other teams realize something or maybe teams don't think you've got any gas left in the tank. So that to me is going to be uh, the, the bigger question rather than how these guys will fit in, whether it's character wise or personality wise or, um, you know, schematically, like I was talking to Cole Holcomb, after Thursday's practice. And he's another guy who he, you know, he acknowledged that he's not full go just yet in uh, team activities, but he appreciates that while he's here getting this jump start on things, even though they're taking it slow with him, he's not just kind of out there on an island with, uh, here are a few guys I'm going to be playing next to. No, I mean, it's everybody from the defense. He, he said he appreciates that even entrenched players like Cam Hayward, TJ Watt, Minka Fitzpatrick are there with him now. Uh, just to get an early head start on communication and uh, what they're seeing, uh, whether it's on the field or from the sideline in his case. And, and that's going to be crucial for an inside linebacker because you really have to tie – you're the rug that ties the room together. So mm -hmm. uh, the Steelers have had that rug trampled on a little bit too often in, in recent seasons. So, I mean, Holcomb obviously has to do the job physically, but uh, the football IQ part of that position specifically – as well as is crucial and you know they've got a couple uh you know Landon Roberts maybe a little long in the tooth but Holcomb uh you'd hope he's still on the rise going into year five and we'll see how that position shakes out I think um I'm still kind of lukewarm 
on those additions in general. Um, but they just have to be good role players. They don't have to be stars because they're surrounded by the stars. I, I agree. And I think that it might be the key to this defense being successful this year is that there's st the stars are still there. TJ Watt, and if he can be healthy, of course, that's the biggest thing this defense needs compared to last year. If he's healthy throughout the season, he's getting pressure. Alex Highsmith's getting pressure. Cam Hayward and Larry Ogunjobi are still a powerful one-two punch on the defensive line. And now you have a different alignment of guys that can fit behind them with Keanu Benton, Braden Fajoko, Armin Watts, and guys like that. And then as you, and then you still have Minka Fitzpatrick back playing, playing the deep middle there at free safety. Uh, so I look at that. That's a lot of components that are familiar Year, you're not asking Patrick Peterson to come in and give you, you know, five interceptions like he had last year. You're not asking, uh, you're not asking Landon Roberts and Cole Holcomb to be shut down inside linebackers, whether against the run or the pass. You're saying, hey, do your job, fill your roles, and play fit in as puzzle pieces. And I think that that could be a very positive factor that the Steelers carry over for themselves going in you're going into 2023 and uh, at, at least from what we were able to see in the first week of OTAs the smoothing over and the bridging of relationships of new guys to guys that have been there seems to be going pretty well yeah and that's the you know every offense is going to try to look for their mismatches you're not going to have one uh trying to block TJ Watt you're you're not going to have one with Minka Fitzpatrick uh, over the deep third and you know we'll see about guys like Patrick Peterson and Levi Wallace or whether it ends up being Joey Porter Jr. on the outside but it's just going to be crucial for the Steelers for you know your Chandon Sullivan's if you know he told me on Tuesday he's working as the number one slot corner right now with Arthur Millette gone Cam Sutton gone you need your Chandon Sullivan's your Keanu Neal's your DeMonte KZ's your Holcomb's your Roberts to make enough plays when they come to you and not be a weak link on a defense that allows uh, opposing offensive coordinators and quarterbacks to exploit. Now that's easier said than done. Um, but that's, you know, th these are the guys that the Steelers have invested in and trusted to be in those roles at this point. And we're a long way away from finding out just how that'll play out. But uh, all these, all these dudes are getting used to playing with each other right now here in May. And again, you know, they're saying all the right things and, Maybe you're sitting there saying, who cares? But what else are we going to talk about? They're playing football in shorts right now. So I also can't exactly tell you, um, you know, what this defense is going to look like. They don't even know just yet as we sit here one week into OTAs. Absolutely. There's there's still a lot of changes to come. And who knows? There might be another signing that comes around the corner. You know, they brought in Quan Alexander the other week. Maybe they're still looking for another off-ball linebacker to, to jump in with Holcomb Yeah, I mean, you just you watch that group in individual drills and stuff, and it just it jumps out to you how thin it looks right now. I mean, there's mm -hmm. Holcomb, Roberts, Mark Robinson, uh, Tanner Muse, who's really been a career special teamer. Don't I think he's got too many limitations to be anything – more than that, he's essentially the new Marcus Allen. And then, um, you know, there's one or two, kind of, you know, Chappelle Russell, who was on the practice squad last year. And that that might be just about it for the inside backers right now for the Steelers. So, yeah, I mean, just I'm sure as the uh, scouting department kind of takes stock of where the roster's strong, where it's weak right now, I would think that's one position group uh, on the depth chart on paper where you say, yeah, we might be might be a little weak. Maybe we can add somebody there, but we'll see. We, we will see. And the idea of Tanner Muse being the new Marcus Allen, I wonder what kind of music he would play after wins in the locker room. I guess we could go ask him next week. Say, hey, man, the uh, the previous uh, ILB4, not to put you in a box, buddy, but the previous ILB4 slash, uh, you know, special teamer uh, liked to play his music pretty loud. What are you rocking with, uh, Tanner Muse? But I, I have not uh, spoken <laughs> just yet with the new number 44. Well, get in on it. What do you? What do we have you for, Brian? That's what, ask the big questions. That's what week three of OTAs is for, Chris. Um, you know, we'll we'll certainly see how it goes. But no, it was, it was nice to have. You know, uh, shout out to the Steelers PR team for mm -hmm. giving us those open locker rooms after each day of practice. You know, you get a chance to catch up with some uh, some old pals uh, from previous seasons and meet some new guys uh, like Cole Holcomb or Patrick Peterson or Braden Fihoko, uh types like that. 
Absolutely. Brian, thank you so much for all your time. Following all of his great work, great work, along with all of our Steelers team, Ray Fittipato and Jerry Dulac at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, post, post-gazette.com. Subscribe to the newspaper to get all of our great written content and come here for all of our, all, as we break things down here in the North Shore Drive podcast, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We're going to take one more break. When I come back, I've got Andrew Destin, who's not on the road for Seattle, but he's got a lot of thoughts on how the Pirates are handling their infielder situation right now and how it's led to their problems with base running and other things that they need to fix before they before they try to hold on to that slim, narrow margin that gives them a winning record right now. All that the, on the Pirates here in the North Shore Drive podcast. We'll be right back. We're back here on the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. We switched topics from uh, the the Pittsburgh Steelers to the Pittsburgh Pirates, who had Thursday off after losing back-to-back series against the Rangers and the Diamondbacks 2-1 to one in both situations. And in both situations, they won the first game and then lost the other two. We have Andrew Destin here with us here as Jason Mackey's on the road headed to Seattle. We'll get to that series with the Mariners coming up. But, Andrew, we were talking beforehand with the show, and – of all the things that have changed from the Pirates' really great run in April to this terrible month of May that they've had, one of the things that you were pointing out were some of, some of the younger guys that were stepping up earlier and now not stepping up as much, and that's Rodolfo Castro and G1 Bay. Castro now not as much of a starting the starting lineup here. What have you seen that they've that's been different about these guys and what they were contributing, and is it something that could eventually maybe even change back if they're able to correct some things? Yeah, the Rodolfo Castro one is such an interesting one to unpack because there's there's really so much there, ju- just given uh, what his situation with the team is and what the team's needs are. Um, it, what's happened with him is in conjunction with some you know exceptional play, I guess you could put it, from Tuca Pita Marcano, who's kind of seized that starting shortstop job with O'Neill Cruz out. Um, it's in turn led to Rodolfo Castro no longer being an everyday player, which if you go back to April, like if we go back to that juncture, yeah, he was splitting time at second base with G1 Bay, but he was – pretty frequently in the lineup. And then once Cruz went down, right, Castro slid over to short, and the defensive metrics weren't great there, so the Pirates decided to shake things up, get Marcano up, and uh, make him a regular guy. But in doing that, they didn't switch Castro back over to second and say, all right, well, you're still going to get the majority of the games and majority of the reps there. Um, His splits, his splits against left-handed and right-handed pitching have essentially forced him into a platoon. Um, You know, he's one of the best hitters in baseball against uh, left-handed pitching, his slash line is tremendous. Um, you know, all five of his home runs have come against him. And yeah, he's not hitting righties great. And as a result of that, now the G1 Bay, the left handed hitting G1 Bay, he's getting the majority of the times at, uh, of the reps at second base because, come on, mm-hmm. there's more right handed pitchers. So yeah. the guy that you would argue is probably the better prospect or the better talent at the major league level in Castro is now just based on what handed pitcher is on the mound, is now getting less playing time than Bay. Um, and that's all just because, I mean, it's probably more complicated than this, but the way the sequence of events worked out, it was kind of like, hey, Castro, we're going to let you try to become the everyday shortstop. That didn't work out. Okay, we're going to bench you now. Versus, like, there, there's a healthy middle ground there. There's a, we're going to get your bat in the lineup five out of seven games or four out of six, whatever it is. And recently, he has not been playing uh, against right-handed pitching. Uh, two starts against right-handers since May 6th. Um, you go, the lefties, he's still hitting them as well as he ever is. And G1 Bay is getting the majority of the reps there, which, you know, that, that's just – it's not an indictment on Bay. It's somebody who maybe uh, is just not the guy who needs to be getting every single rep there. I look at it as Castro and him should be splitting. Um, yes, Bay is hitting fairly well in the month of uh, in the month of May, but he's also running into a lot of outs on the base paths. Um, mm-hmm. In the first month in March and April, I think he was 11 of 12 on stolen base attempts. Now he's only 3 of 7. So even if he's getting on base, it's kind of a moot point because he's just getting gunned down, which is kind of a theme about the Pirates in general of maybe being a little bit too risque on the bases and things like that. But um, that's the first change that stands out to me is get Castro's bat in the lineup every day. It's a guy who has shown the ability to hit across his 500 roughly uh, plate appearances in the major league level, especially in the minor leagues too. Um, That's not to say that Bay can't be a quality, productive MLB player too, but I just think there's more potential there with Castro and what he's shown against uh, left-handed pitching, got to let him work through the kinks on the right-handed side. And maybe it's well, even considering making him just a right-handed hitter instead of a switch hitter. 
No, I, I I hear that. My other thing, though, you know, and you you harped on it a bit here is the difference in the base running. The, the Pirates going into you know you know just a little bit ago. One thing that Jason and I talked a lot about on this show was the fact that they were they led all of Major League Baseball in stolen bases for like a month. They and it was for a while it was like a, a, a chasm between them and like the next several teams. Now they're not even leading anymore. They're fifty. They have fifty three on the season. That's ranked second now behind the Rays and everyone else is catching up to them. The Oakland A's are there. The Cleveland Guardians. The Baltimore Orioles. And like you said, some of them have just been bad base running. And you know, just sometimes you just the moments where you look at it and you're just like, oh man, that was a big big error there. And Juan Bay, a guy who was a big part of you know the stolen bases now not being part of that what's been the problem with base running and is is this is this more of a a situation that you think is just averaging out from all the success they had earlier or is this more like you know they've they're not doing as many things right and this is very fixable i think both things can be true but i'm going to address the the first the first point of yes things are kind of regressing back to the mean but the reasoning for that is because i don't think the pirates are picking their spots as strategically anymore and the reason I say that is because you look across the board at what they were doing as a team hitting in the month of April, right? Guys were putting the ball in play at a prolific clip. There was one point where the team was 20 and eight. When everybody's hitting, you can create, uh, cause havoc on the base pass a lot better. Um, you, you can do that certainly uh, more aggressively, but also more calculated. You know, it's not in obvious situations. Let's say it's one out and it's a runner on first and your nine hitter is up, you know, that's probably a sack bunt situation, right? Like those kind of things arise when it comes to stolen bases too. And opposing teams, I think, are are keenly aware of that because now they're getting predictable. And you can say that across the board, whether that's some of the pitchers getting predictable with um, thrown off speed because other teams have caught on to that trend, or you can go to the stolen bases. When you're not scoring runs, when you're not putting the ball in play as frequently as the Pirates were in April, yeah, you're going to try to force things on the base pass. I think that's exactly what we've seen from the Pirates. Um, and it's starting to catch up with them a little bit. So it might seem counterintuitive that, well, if you have less guys on the bases and you're stealing less, um, wouldn't you think that the clip would be better? Well, no, it's less efficient because it's now more obvious when it's going to happen. So um, I, I think they can certainly bounce back and be better at it. But when you're forcing it, when you're picking the spots, um, you know, maybe not as schematically as you'd like to, I think that's why we're seeing the issues that we're seeing right now with the Pirates. I hear you on that. Let's look forward a little bit here. They got a series with the Mariners here in, in Seattle. Again, Jason Mackey will be on hand in Seattle covering that right there, right there for him. But uh, they're, they're playing a team right now that has the, has the same record as them. The Mariners though, in the AL West, they're in fourth in their division, whereas the Pirates are in second, just another reminder of how, how far down that the NL Central has fallen this year. But let's talk about this series. What are things that you're looking forward to here as far as what the Pirates are matching up with? Mitch Keller will take the mound uh, fr Friday night in Seattle with a late 10, 10 after 10 uh, Eastern time start there. What are you looking for? Is And is this the first chance the Pirates, or is this the first time the Pirates could win a series dating all the way back to late April? Yeah, it's an interesting one because this is a Mariners team that in a lot of ways has kind of underperformed this season. Um, the 25-24 and 24 record looks great, certainly. And, uh, you know, I'll put my personal pride aside with the Oakland A's. I mean, they're 10-41. and 41. That's going to help any team in their division, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they certainly – any team in the AL West is going to love the A's presence and keep racking up those win totals, right? But, um, but uh, I mean, the Mariners still obviously a team that, you know, broke the postseason curse last year. Uh, the guys that they got on roster, Jared Kelenic's finally coming into his own, always been a coveted prospect, Teoscar Hernandez, Cal Raley, Julio Rodriguez, who burst on the scene last year in the home run derby. I mean, this is a pretty good lineup, uh, certainly, that uh, has to, you know, perform in a pitcher-friendly park, um, you know, in T-Mobile Field. So um, this is certainly, though, this is going to be a big challenge for Keller as well as the rest of the Pirates pitchers. Um, and this is no slouch of a Mariners team. I mean, they're starting to heat up a little bit. They won three in a row. Um, you know, five of their last 10. So not great in that aspect, but um, they're a team that you probably have higher expectations for. And that's a very difficult AL West too. I mean, we just saw it happen here in Pittsburgh with the Texas Rangers coming to town, uh, a team that probably didn't have their best stuff uh, in terms of what they were doing at the plate. That's a team that has been on fire hitting this season. Um, and the Pirates pitchers kind of stymied them a little bit, but man, that rotation, I mean, we saw it the last game with uh, Nathan Eovaldi, or that was the second yeah. last game, Martin Perez. Totally. Too. I mean, these are arms who came through in significant ways. So for the Mariners, you're probably less concerned about the pitching. Um, it's more the lineup you got to be uh, curious about. And, um, you know, it, it's 
the Pacific Northwest in springtime, anything can happen in terms of weather. It can be either a beautiful day or can be a little bit overcast, and that ball's not really going to travel on you. So um, curious to see how Mitch Keller in specific does against this Mariners lineup and really all the Pirates pitchers in general because uh, that's no joke what they got over there in Seattle. Before we before we go here, Andrew, give us a prediction. What what's how does this series go? Three games in Seattle. Ooh, man, it's it's tough. I look at the month of May and the Pirates, man, haven't won a series yet this uh this month. I don't think this is the one that they get it. If I'm picking a series on the road trip of the two that the Pirates are going to win, I would probably lean towards uh, in San Francisco against the Giants. But um, you know, who knows? It's going to be a tough one certainly in Seattle. But I'm going to go with the Mariners winning that series again, two to one to infuriate Pirates fans and likely come into a rubber match so that Seattle comes out on top and. I hear you there. You can get all our great coverage at postdeskgazette.com. He's Andrew Destin. He covers a lot of things for us here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and has been helping out a lot on the Pirates beat. Thank you, Andrew, to all your hard work. Again, check out Jason Mackey. He's going to be in Seattle with the live coverage for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Thanks again to Brian Batko and all the Steelers coverage we've had from the OTAs. We will be taking off Memorial Day for Monday, but we'll be back Wednesday here on the North Shore Drive podcast, breaking things down as OTAs continue for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Thanks for checking us out here on your favorite podcasting app or on youtube again find the north shore drive podcast wherever you do find podcasts and all our great work at the pittsburgh post gazette we'll see you next week happy memorial day weekend thanks for tuning in to another episode of the north shore drive podcast of the pittsburgh post gazette if you're watching this video on youtube please like the video and subscribe to our youtube channel for six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just six dollars click the link down below in the description